Okay, guys, um, we're going to finish up Chapter 17 here, um, talking about blood and its functions. And we had actually left off uh, talking about hemostasis. And what you're looking at here is a step-by-step -step breakdown of what happens when the body attempts to restrict the flow of blood out of the body uh, in order to maintain now all the valuable components that you find in both the formed elements and in the plasma. So step one is a vascular spasm. Now what does that mean? That means that the smooth muscle, which is found primarily in the tunica media of the blood vessels, that's the middle layer of tissue uh, that's bordered on the outside by the tunica externa and the tunica intima, what it'll do is it'll contract and it does this in response to the production of certain chemical intermediates that leak out of the cells during tissue damage. The next thing that will happen is that blood flow will temporarily stop through that region. And this helps to decrease the amount of blood loss at the point of the injury. The next thing that will happen is that platelets, also known as thrombocytes, which you find as the second most um, numerous element in the formed elements of blood, will snag on the damaged tissue and will begin to to uh, burst and release clotting factors. So as they adhere to the collagen fibers and begin to release their clotting factors, uh, they also begin to form what we call a platelet plug. So this is like a temporary block to keep us from losing more blood than we otherwise would. And then as the clotting factors begin their cascade, what happens is that we begin to form now an actual blood clot, and this is what's called coagulation. Coagulation ends at the point at which fibrinogen is converted into fibrin, which forms a mesh, and this mesh traps red blood cells and platelets, and this becomes now the second plug at the site of the injury. What happens afterwards is that cells will move in and attempt to repair the injury, and then eventually the clot will be dissolved after it's served its useful purpose. So if we look at these processes in a little bit more detail and we examine coagulation, prothrombin activator is formed in both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. What are these pathways? They're just two different chemical cascades that end up in the production of a blood clot and they, they actually start out um, responding to completely different stimuli, but they end up ultimately as uh, the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin and the production of the clot. Prothrombin is converted to the enzyme thrombin, and thrombin is what actually catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, and it's the fibrin that's the insoluble protein that ends up trapping the platelets and the RBCs and whatever else happens to wander by the injury site. So let's examine these two pathways that lead to prothrombin activator. It can be initiated by either the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway, but often by both at the same time. It's triggered by tissue damaging events, which involves a series of procoagulants. Well, what is the heck is a procoagulant? It's just a chemical that promotes coagulation. Each pathway cascades towards a protein that's in the plasma known as factor 10. Factor 10 complexes with calcium, um, PF3, and factor 5 to form prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator is what is going to eventually trigger the production of fibrinogen into fibrin. The intrinsic pathway is triggered by negatively charged surfaces, such as activation by platelets, collagen, or foreign substances. Uh, it uses factors present within the blood already, while the extrinsic pathway is triggered by exposure to tissue factor or factor 3, which is an extrinsic factor. So the starting points are a little bit different. Uh, when you're looking at the intrinsic factor, um, we're talking here about something that's coming in from the outside, basically. Exposure to collagen, for instance, would result uh, from injury to tissue, activated platelets would result from them basically sticking to the collagen fibrils. Um, glass and foreign substances uh, 
often are seen at the site of an injury, uh, such as in a laceration or in a puncture. So it uses factors that are present within the blood. That's why it's called intrinsic um, pathway. The extrinsic pathway is triggered by exposure to tissue factor or factor 3. It bypasses several steps of the intrinsic pathway, so it ends up actually being a quicker way to generate a clot. Prothrombin activator catalyzes the transformation of prothrombin to the active enzyme thrombin. Whenever you see the prefix pro in front of the name of a particular enzyme or protein, what it means is that it's in an inactive state. And generally what happens is that it'll be transformed, usually through an enzymatic cleavage, from an inactive to an active state, at which point now it is able to either catalyze the chemical reaction in which it's involved, or, in this case, to trigger the clotting cascade. Once prothrombin activator is formed, the clot forms in about 10 to 15 seconds. Now you might wonder um, why it is that prothrombin is produced in an inactive form initially. And the reason is so that clotting doesn't spontaneously occur all over the body. The, the body uses this strategy when it wants to delay the activation of a particular enzyme or protein in a cascade so that it doesn't just begin to spontaneously fire, spontaneously execute. The idea behind the prothrombin is that it's there if it's needed, but we need an extraordinary event in order to trigger its activation. So as produced straight off of the messenger RNA, this protein isn't capable of doing anything. It's only after cleavage of particular um, bonds between amino acids that it goes from the inactive to the activated form. Okay, so now we get to the common pathway. Thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which strands form the basis of a clot by trapping now, uh, passing platelets, passing erythrocytes. Uh, it also causes the plasma to become a gel-like trap, and this further ensnares the formed elements. The thrombin, along with calcium, activates factor 13, which cross-links the fibrin and strengthens and stabilizes the clot. And then that clot is going to stay around until it's no longer needed, at which point um, clot-busting enzymes will dissolve the clot, uh, the components of the clot will be recycled, and by that time what we've done is we've affected tissue repair so that we quit the loss of blood. And so here you're looking at a diagram showing you these different these different parts of the clotting pathway. So in phase one, let's look, for instance, at the extrinsic pathway first, okay? This is where we're starting the whole thing. We have an injury, right? A tissue cell trauma exposes the blood to tissue factor. Why? Because we've damaged cells in the area and they're starting to leak tissue factor into the surrounding environment. Tissue factor along with calcium, along with factor seven, uh, eventually ends up forming a tissue factor, uh, factor 7A complex, and this is going to catalyze the conversion of factor 10 into an activated factor 10, which is ultimately going to activate factor 5, and then factor 5 is going to, along with calcium and PF3, activate prothrombin. Okay, so that's the extrinsic pathway. And you might say, well, wh where are all these crazy factors? Where, where are they? They're in the plasma. They're already there. They're already made. And they're just kind of waiting around for an event. Okay? In the intrinsic pathway, what we have is um, the triggering event being the vessel endothelia rupturing and exposing underlying tissue, such as collagen. Okay? So again, an event from the outside has disturbed our homeostasis. The platelets cling to their surface and provide sites for mobilization of the different factors. We start here with the activation of factor 12, which in turn activates factor 11, which in turn, along with factor, activated factor 7, activates factor 9, with the presence of calcium being very important in this pathway. And then, along with PF3, which is released by aggravated platelets, aggregated platelets rather, um, 
we activate now factor 8 and we form now uh, an activated factor 8 and 9 complex which activates factor 10 which activates factor 5 which ultimately in the presence of calcium and PF3 activates prothrombin and so if you look at this you, you might think well gee that's awfully complicated and you'd be correct that that's several steps if we look at the uh, intrinsic pathway you've got here one two three four five six seven steps why so many steps why can't we just do it all in one step well the reason for this is that remember that a cascade is set up to amplify a biological signal that's the whole strategy behind this arrangement of proteins that are waiting to be activated and remember we talked about using the illustration of freeze tag the game you used to play when you were little right if you were it in freeze tag what did you get to do you got to run around and everybody you touched they had to freeze and not move and you could touch more than one person okay and it's the same sort of strategy here with the intrinsic pathway at each step in the cascade it's not as if it's just a one-to-one -one correspondence it's not as if for instance when we activate factor 12 it only activates one molecule of factor 11 it may activate several or several hundred in turn factor 11 may activate several hundred factor nines and so forth and so what happens in this cascade is that the signal gets amplified at every step it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger okay until we finally end up ultimately with the production here of a clot now not only do we amplify the signal at each step in the cascade and as a result respond very rapidly to the stimulus the other nice thing about a cascade is the cascade's easy to shut off because all you have to do to shut the cascade off is to stop now the initial event okay in the case of the intrinsic pathway um, this would be now the repair of the damaged vessel wall right and now no longer will we be activating in this case factor 12 in the case of the extrinsic pathway um, it would it'll happen once the tissue factor is no longer being secreted into the blood plasma and at that point this entire cascade will stop okay so that's that's the whole point behind having this complex pathway that gets you to a single endpoint the amplification of the signal and the ability to very easily turn the cascade off once it's served its purpose and we see cascades in living systems in a lot of different places we see them in this case in an extracellular cascade and we see them also inside cells when we look at things like receptor signaling which involves a sequence of events that ultimately ends up generally with either the transcription of a particular gene which results in the production of a gene product that carries out a particular task or perhaps the opening of an ion channel or some other immediate response by the cell at which point now that we've carried out the task of the cascade we can turn off the initial events that started it and then return to our original state now if we look at phase two what we see here is prothrombin being activated uh, in becoming now thrombin and the thrombin the activated thrombin is able to convert fibrinogen which is again um, it, we can call it the inactive form of fibrin if you like because it's not capable of forming a clot on its own it's soluble in plasma but if once thrombin acts on it what happens is it cleaves particular um, covalent bonds in the fibrinogen and now this becomes an insoluble protein that is capable of trapping cells as they pass by and it also all by itself is an insoluble polymer okay this uh, reaction is also dependent on the activation of factor 13 which happens in the presence of calcium and thrombin and this ultimately results now in this cross-linked mesh in which we're capable of trapping now all manner of formed elements and this is going to serve now as our temporary block against blood loss while other cells come in and repair the tissue so let's talk about what happens after we make the clot once we've got the clot in place 
that's sort of like on a construction project putting up the the uh, do not enter sign say on on a highway entrance ramp or a uh, store closed sign right while the crew is in there affecting repairs so once the clot is up that's like our do not enter sign now what happens in inside um, the tissue that has been damaged what's going on well clot retraction is basically where the clot begins to shrink this clot will stabilize actin and myosin in the platelets will contract within an hour to a half an hour and this pulls on the fibrin strand strands and it squeezes serum out of the clot and it draws ruptured blood vessel edges closer together and what's the purpose of that well to make the repair easier right it's it's much easier to stitch two things together if they're near each other than if they're really really far apart so let's talk about vessel repair once we have brought the two ends in close apposition the vessel can now affect healing platelet derived growth factor is a chemical signal that stimulates the division of smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts and this helps rebuild the blood vessel wall and vascular endothelial growth factor stimulates the endothelial cells to multiply and restore the endothelial lining. So basically what's happening here is that chemical signals are being given off that promote the multiplication and the growth of the cells that are eventually going to seal off the wound and perform the same function as the original tissue. Fibrinolysis is what takes place after we've repaired the tissue. We can now get rid of the clot because we've affected our repairs. So it removes the unneeded clot after the healing takes place. This usually begins within two days and continues for several days afterwards. Plasminogen in the clot is converted to plasmin by tissue plasminogen, plasminogen activator, abbreviated TPA, factor 12, and thrombin. Plasmin is the fiber digesting enzyme that results from this series of events. Two mechanisms can limit clot size because we don't want clotting to run out of control. In fact, there are conditions in which clotting happens in an uncontrolled fashion, and this results in all sorts of problems. Um, if, if you start to spontaneously clot throughout the circulatory system, you can imagine some of the problems that might occur, right, if you think about it. Now think for a minute um, what would happen if your blood just started to spontaneously clot all over your body. Well, eventually those clots, if they were moving clots, which are called emboli, could lodge in capillary beds and choke off the flow of blood to downstream tissue and cause it to die, right? That'd be a disaster. That would result in tissue necrosis, cell death. Um, other things that would happen is that with these formation of all these spontaneous clots all over the place, you would actually begin to use up a lot of the components of the clotting cascade and paradoxically if you were injured you would begin to bleed and you'd be unable to stop the blood loss because again you've run out of all of those factors that have to be present in a certain concentration in order for the clotting cascade to execute. Okay, So two mechanisms limit clot size. Swift removal and dilution of the clotting factors is one inhibition of the activated clotting factors is another. Now this is interesting, okay, this swift removal and dilution of the clotting factors. This happens because your blood flows through your blood vessels, okay, and how does the blood flow, flow through the blood vessels? Primarily through the pumping action of the ventricles of the heart, but also to some extent by the fact that you move, right? Um, one of the things we're going to find out when we talk about the blood vessels this uh, coming Saturday is that in the arteries blood moves around primarily because it's close to the pump the heart but once we get to the capillaries one of the things that happens is that the pressure in those vessels drops dramatically because of all the resistance that the blood meets as it tries to flow through a very narrow channel and then when the blood is recollected by the veins the pressure is so low that we have to have some other mechanism to get it back up to the heart and it turns out that that mechanism involves the valves that you find in veins that are what, what we call one-way valves 
that eventually work the blood back up to the heart as you move, as you walk, as you stand, sit, and run, and so forth. Um, by squeezing the blood up through a series of one-way valves, ultimately to get back to the heart through uh, the right ventricle uh, as it arrives there from the superior and inferior vena cava. So depending on whether we're talking about the arterial system or the venous return to the heart, you've got slightly different factors that move the blood around. But the point is that the blood moves, okay? So right here, okay, this very first point, swift removal and dilution of the clotting factors keep the clotting from get running out of control, right? That's good. But on the other hand, think about what happens if blood flow slows down, okay? How can blood flow slow down? Well, you could have, say, a really bad injury, okay? And because of inflammation and swelling, you could inhibit the flow of blood in and around the injury. Well, what could this result in? This could result in the production of emboli, right? And we already know what emboli can do. Um, this is also a problem in individuals that suffer from a condition known as varicose veins. Varicose veins are a distension of uh, the venous system, particularly in the lower extremities. And you find them primarily in people that perform jobs where they have to stand for long periods of time and the blood tends to pool because you have to remember that it's tough to get blood back to the heart from below the heart because you're fighting gravity. It's easy to get blood back to the heart above it because gravity is working with you. And so if you stand and, and have to remain relatively immobile for long periods of time, what happens now is that blood flow in the venous system slows and you can form spontaneous clots. And so that's one of the reasons that um, uh, you always want to um, move a little bit, even if you're, you're seated or you're standing, um, because you don't want that blood to pool. You don't want spontaneous clotting to happen. It's also one of the reasons why you elevate affected limbs uh, when you're attempting to heal from either a surgical procedure or a bad injury because we don't want that spontaneous clotting to occur. Uh, the inhibition of activated clotting factors is another limiting factor in the growth of clots. Thrombin bound onto fibrin threads is also a limiting factor as well. And antithrombin 3 is a protein that inactivates unbound thrombin and as a result now uh, keeps it from executing now the clotting cascade outside of its um, normal boundaries. Heparin present in basophils and mast cells also inhibits thrombin by enhancing antithrombin 3. Heparin is a member of a class of drugs called anticoagulants. And basically the way these, these components work is that they inhibit the clotting cascade and they decrease blood viscosity. Um, if, you, if you've ever seen a package of Decon in the grocery store, Decon is a, is a, uh, it's a chemical that is impregnated into a feed for mice and you put this in the, in the drawers in your kitchen and wherever you have a, a mouse, rat, or squirrel problem. And what happens is that uh, the, the decon contains a component known as warfarin, which is an anticoagulant. And what happens is that these uh, little animals get a, a heavy dose of this anticoagulant and then they go off and do what rodents do, which is get in fights uh, and puncture and lacerate themselves, and they can't stop bleeding because of all the anticoagulant that's in their blood. And the idea is that the way the decon operates is that the mouse will be far, far away from your house by the time that happens, and so he'll bleed to death out in the yard somewhere as opposed to dying inside your walls, as would happen with a mouse trap. Uh, and as a result, this is one of the things that you read on the decon package is that you don't want your dog, your cat, or your, or your children to um, be near any of that stuff or to consume it because it'll have the same effect on them. But heparin and warfarin are both anticoagulants. Okay, platelet adhesion is prevented by the smooth endothelia of the blood vessels that prevents the plates from clinging. Basically, um, the endothelia normally repels the formed elements of blood, keeps them from sticking there. There's also antithrombic substances such as nitric oxide and prostacyclin that are secreted by endothelial cells. 
and vitamin E acts as a potent anticoagulant as well. There are some times uh, when this clotting cascade doesn't work the way it's supposed to. These are called disorders of hemostasis, and you can probably guess what two classes they fall into, either too much clotting or too little clotting. Okay? And so it, within these two broad classes, thromboembolic disorders are undesirable clot formations, while bleeding disorders are abnormalities that prevent normal clot formation. Disseminated intravascular coagulation involves both types of these disorders, and essentially what happens in this disease is that you spontaneously clot throughout the body. And we already talked about the disastrous consequences of this. The fact that you you titrate out, you dilute those clotting factors to the point where if you do have an injury, you'll tend to bleed out. And then you produce all these emboli that travel around the body and can lodge very easily in capillary beds. Now you might think, well, gee, big fat deal. I've got, a, I've got an embolus lodged in a capillary bed and some tissue might die. Why is this a big deal? Well, um, generally speaking, um, it's unpleasant but not life-threatening. But if it happens in the heart, it can cause a heart attack. And if it happens in the brain, it can cause a stroke. And both of these are obviously lethal outcomes in many cases. A thrombus is a clot that develops and persists in an unbroken blood vessel, and it can block circulation, leading to tissue death. And this is that first kind of tissue death we talked about in class, necrosis. This is tissue death due to insult or injury. An embolus is a thrombus that is freely floating in the bloodstream, so it's on the move. And it eventually will lodge in a narrow vessel. Okay? Um, basically, the diameter of the blood vessels decrease and decrease and decrease until we get all the way to the capillaries, which are the narrowest vessels in the body. It's very difficult for a clot to traverse a, a, a tiny little capillary. It'll, it'll easily lodge there. An embolism is an embolus obstructing a vessel, such as a pulmonary or cerebral embolus. Pulmonary embolus would be in the lungs, for instance, and a cerebral embolus would be in the brain tissue. What are some of the risk factors for these thromboembolic conditions? Well, arteriosclerosis, inflammation, slowly flowing blood or blood stasis from immobility. So let's break down each of these. Arteriosclerosis, what the heck is that? I'm sure you've heard that term before, but you've never really examined what it is. Basically, arteriosclerosis is a narrowing of the blood vessels due to the deposition of plaque on the surface of the endothelium. So what happens in arteriosclerosis is that the vessels become hardened and the lumens begin to narrow, and as a result, the pressure in those vessels goes up. The danger here is that as... Um, the pressure in these vessels goes up, two things can happen. You can burst capillary beds by increasing the systemic pressure because there's only a certain amount of pressure that the capillary can withstand before it'll blow. And if that happens, what you'll have is tissue death due to lack of blood flow, not because of, of, a, of the block of that capillary, but because now we're bleeding out. Okay, and So we're not getting the blood all to all the tissues in a timely fashion. The other problem that can occur as a result of these narrow lumens is that the plaque itself can get knocked free from the endothelium and it, it by itself can act as an embolus that can lodge in a capillary bed. And obviously we talked about the fact that this is going to increase the risk of myocardial infarction, aka heart attack, or um, a stroke. How about inflammation? What is inflammation? Well, inflammation is just the body's response to injury, and the classic signs of inflammation include edema, erythema, pain, and increased temperature. Okay? Now, edema, what the heck is that? Edema just means swelling up, okay? usually due to an accumulation of fluid. Erythema means reddening, and this is usually the result of blood flowing to the area. Pain, you know, okay, and the increased heat um, is a function partly of the blood coming to the area, but partly as a result of um, chemicals that are released at the site of the inflammation 
that are designed to increase the temperature in that particular tissue compartment. The inflammatory process is a good thing, generally speaking, because it is designed to deal with an injury or an infection by bringing blood to the area and with that blood come the white blood cells that are going to fight the infection and repair the tissue. But if we have generalized inflammation inside the vessels or in tissue, what can happen now is that we, we're going to slow the flow of blood. And as the blood flow slows down, now we're going to spontaneously clot because what will happen is that those clotting factors will become transiently concentrated. And if they become too concentrated, the clotting cascade will just randomly fire. Okay? Other risk factors include slowly flowing blood or blood stasis from immobility. Um, slowly flowing blood, how can that happen? Well, inactivity is one way that can happen, right? If you don't move much, then you're not going to be able to get a lot of venous return to the heart because you're not doing a lot of skeletal muscle contraction, which is what pushes the blood back to the heart from the lower extremities in the fight against gravity. Okay? Um, slowly flowing blood can also result from a healing injury. Uh, you can imagine, for instance, somebody that's had a surgical procedure done and the, the place where the surgery has been done has a lot of edema, okay? And if there is a lot of tissue fluid there, there's a lot of pressure on the vessels, there's a lot of pressure on the vessels, you're going to slow the flow of blood through the area and spontaneous clotting can be the result. So let's talk about some common anticoagulants. Aspirin is an easy one. It's an antiprostaglandin that inhibits thromboxane A2. Heparin is an anticoagulant used clinically for pre- and post-operative cardiac care. Warfarin is the component that we talked about in decon, also known as Coumadin, and it's used for those prone to atrial fib. Uh, it interferes with the action of vitamin K, and as a result now um, decreases blood viscosity and the tendency of the blood to clot. Dabigatrin directly inhibits thrombin. Okay, so all these are anticoagulants, and they work in a slightly different um, a slightly different point in the coagulation cascade. But the end product is the same. The blood tends not to clot. Okay. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, vitamin K. Where where did vitamin K come in? Well, vitamin K is uh, one of the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and uh, it's actually produced in the large intestine by bacteria that ferment the fiber and the other waste products that come from the small intestine into the large intestine. We absorb this vitamin K directly into the bloodstream and it serves as a cofactor in the clotting cascade. Okay, so we need vitamin K either as a result of our endosymbionts, the bacteria that live with us, or we need to ingest it as a supplement in order for clotting to occur. Okay, let's talk about bleeding disorders. Thrombocytopenia is a deficient number of circulating platelets. Petechiae appear due to spontaneous widespread hemorrhaging. And what are petechiae? They're just little spots of blood where, where um, you sort of bleed out under the skin. And they look like little red splotches. You can see them in the sclera of the eye. Um, you can see them under the skin, uh, and they indicate now that we have a deficiency in the clotting cascade. It's usually due to a suppression or a destruction of red marrow, which can come from either a malignancy in the hematopoietic stem cells, so cancer of the hematopoietic stem cells can come from radiation treatment, and it can also come as a result of certain drugs. A platelet count below 50,000 per microliter is usually the diagnostic tipping point uh, indicating thrombocytopenia. It's generally treated with transfusion of concentrated platelets. Impaired liver function can also lead to bleeding disorders because the liver produces procoagulants. Uh, causes include vitamin K deficiency, hepatitis, and cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is essentially the death of liver tissue uh, and as a result, the loss of liver function, often due to uh, abusing recreational drugs or excessive intake of alcohol over an extended period of time. 
we can also have impaired fat absorption and liver disease can also prevent liver from producing bile uh, which impairs fat and vitamin K absorption so uh, even though the vitamin K may be around if the liver isn't doing its job we're going to have a difficult time um, getting it ultimately into the circulation from the small intestine and as a result now we're going to lack this critical component in the clotting cascade. I mean, you have to think now in terms of what's important, right? If you have a multi-step process, um, it's good in the sense that it, uh, the way that the cascade process is set up, we magnify the initial stimulus and ultimately end up at our goal, in this case of creating a clot. And it's also good in the sense that we can easily turn it off once it's served its purpose. But it's bad in the sense that there are many opportunities to have a component go missing. Right? And if any of these components in the clotting cascade is missing or deficient, you're not going to clot and you're going to tend to bleed out. Okay? Hemophilia is another type of bleeding disorder. It includes several similar hereditary bleeding disorders. Hemophilia A is the most common type makes up a little over three-quarters of all cases, and it's a factor eight deficiency that's inherited. Hemophilia B is a factor nine deficiency, while hemophilia C is a mild type, and it's a factor 11 deficiency. Symptoms include prolonged bleeding, especially into joint cavities. We treat this with plasma transfusion and the injection of missing factors. Uh, what are some of the risks here? Increased risk of hepatitis and increased risk of HIV. What is hepatitis? It's an inflammation of the liver often due to a viral infection and HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus and this is the agent of AIDS which is the acronym for acquired immune deficiency syndrome and essentially uh, what happens here is that we leave ourselves open now for viral attack as a result of having these problems uh, with these disorders, these bleeding deficiencies. Now, several of these hemophilias, such as uh, hemophilia A, um, are found, their genes are found on the X chromosome, so they are said to be sex-linked. A uh, sex-linked uh, trait is a trait that occurs on the X. You have to remember that women are born with two X chromosomes, while men are born only with one X chromosome. And so, for men, uh, anything that's defective that shows up on the X is going to be expressed as a trait. So men are said to be hemizygous for the genes that are present on the X. And so a lot of conditions that are essentially recessive conditions where normally you'd need two bad genes in order for the disease state to show up. In men you only need one because the Y chromosome has no genetic information to cover up what is being expressed on the defective gene whereas women with two X chromosomes would need to have two bad copies of a defective gene in order for the disease to be expressed so there are several um, sex linked traits that uh, are m more prevalent in males and females hemophilia is one color blindness is another and male pattern baldness is a third Okay, disseminated intravascular coagulation um, is widespread clotting that causes bleeding and also um, tissue necrosis due to lack of blood flow to certain areas as, as capillary beds get blocked due to these spontaneous clots. Widespread clotting blocks intact blood vessels. Severe bleeding occurs because residual blood is unable to clot because all those clotting factors have been used up in producing these spontaneous clots. It can occur as, preg as a pregnancy complication. It can also occur in septicemia. Now what is septicemia? That's just the presence of bacteria in the bloodstream. It's a very dangerous condition uh, because bacteria in the bloodstream um, can travel now all over the body and infect all the internal organs. And this can lead to a condition called MODS. Let's draw that up here. M O D S. And what does MODS stand for? It stands for Multiple Organ Dysfunction Syndrome. 
And this can very often lead to death. Okay, So this is one of the reasons why, and you'll see this when we talk about the immune system, the body has so many fail-safes in place to try and keep bacteria from getting into our tissue fluid or into our bloodstream, because if it does, we have a terrible time fighting it off. Transfusions are basically the movement of blood from a donor to a recipient. Whole blood transfusions are used when blood loss is rapid and substantial. Packed red cells, which are plasma and white blood cells, which have been removed and the packed red cells are usually suspended in physiological saline, are transferred to uh, restore oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. So when you donate blood, for those that are from Cincinnati, uh, the place that does that is Hawksworth in Dayton. Um, I'm sure there is a, a major facility there where they take blood donations. What they do when they take a unit of whole blood is that they essentially um, bleed you out into a plastic bag. They take the whole blood and then they'll take that unit and they will rinse the plasma away using physiological saline and what this does is this dilutes out your antibodies and your plasma proteins while preserving the red cells and keeping them from bursting because what they're suspended in now is an isotonic salt solution and so this um, alleviates any problem that you might have with the donor antibodies and the recipient antigens when you're attempting to give a transfusion this is this is typical uh, procedure for blood donations. So we don't want those white cells and we don't want those those antibodies in there that could cause problems. Transfusion of incompatible blood can be fatal because of a, a process known as agglutination. And we saw this in lab last Saturday when we did our ABO testing. Agglutination is just um, the clumping together of red blood cells. Okay, so let's draw a couple of red blood cells here. And this occurs as a result of the interaction of red blood cells with antibodies. And antibodies have a minimum of two antigen binding sites on their surface. And so what I'm drawing here, this little Y-shaped thing, that's the antibody. This is the RBC. Let's fill it in. Okay. And so what you can see happening here as this complex begins to grow is that eventually we're going to form this high molecular weight complex that will eventually fall out of solution and eventually these red blood cells will be destroyed in a process called hemolysis. Okay, This is a bad deal. Okay, um, These damaged blood cells number one can't carry oxygen, number two um, it can result now in the production of emboli that can end up now blocking capillary beds and killing the recipients. This is why um, blood typing is always done prior to a transfusion in order to determine the compatibility of the recipient for the donor blood. Red blood cell membranes bear about 30 different types of glycoprotein antigens. Okay, and here we go again. Glycoprotein. What is a glycoprotein? Okay, glyco means sugar. And protein means protein. Okay, So what is a glycoprotein? It is a protein with sugar components attached to it. And these antigens act as ID tags for your red blood cells. So anything perceived as foreign can generate an immune response. And what would be perceived as foreign is anything that doesn't have the same antigen display as your normal tissue. Um, Promoters of agglutination, called agglutinogens, are what we refer to these red blood cell antigens as. Mismatched transfused blood can be perceived as foreign. It can be agglutinated and destroyed, and this can be fatal. The presence or absence of each antigen is used to classify blood cells into different groups. Antigens of the ABO and RH blood groups cause vigorous transfusion reactions. Other blood groups, such as MNS, Duffy, Kell, and Lewis, 
are usually weak agglutinogens, and they don't come into play when we're considering um, transfusion compatibility. But essentially, the bottom line to remember here is that whatever antigen you're born with on your red blood cells, you are not going to have the antibody for in your serum. Because if you did, you would agglutinate your own blood and you would die. But you will have antibodies against all the other antigens depending on your blood type. Okay, so let's look at the ABO blood groups first. The different types of blood groups with the ABO system are A, B, AB, and O. And it's based on the presence or absence of two agglutinogens, A and B, on the surfaces of red blood cells. Blood can contain preformed anti-A or anti-B antibodies known as glutinins. Okay, so a glutinin will react with an agglutinogen to form an agglutination. Okay, so those are three words that you want to make sure that you have clear in your mind. They act against transfused red blood cells with ABO antigens not present on the recipient's red cells. Anti-A or anti-B form in blood at about two months of age uh, and they're at adult levels by age 8 to 10. And what you're looking at here is just a chart showing you the ABO groups and what molecules are present in each of the different ABO blood types. Okay, So let's start with an easy blood group. Let's start with type O blood. Okay, An individual with type O blood does not have the A or B antigen on the surface of the red blood cells. Instead, they have um, they have a glycoprotein, but that glycoprotein, the, the O glycoprotein, isn't sufficient to evoke an antibody response. Okay, It's basically the recessive allele of these three variants of these glycoproteins that you can find on the surfaces of the erythrocytes. So an individual with type O blood is going to have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies in their plasma. So what does this mean for them in terms of receiving blood? Well, it means that they cannot receive any blood that contains either an A or a B antigen or both on the surfaces of the red blood cells. It'll attack and destroy it. So these individuals are what are called universal donors, but they can only receive blood from another O individual. Okay, The reason that they can donate blood to anybody, remember, is that the process of collecting blood involves the collecting of whole blood but the removal of the plasma components from the, from the uh, whole blood before it's given as a transfusing unit to another individual. So an individual who is type O who donated their blood would end up now at the end of the day after the whole blood is processed with just the erythrocytes with the O antigen on the surface of the red blood cells and this blood could be given to any of the other blood groups O, A, B, or AB but if an individual is type O they're going to have in their plasma both the anti B and anti A antibodies so if we attempted to give a type O individual either A, B, or AB blood, those incoming antigens would react with the antibodies in the serum of the person with type O blood, and an agglutination reaction would result and the patient could die. Okay? So in a type O individual, you have neither A nor B antigens present on the red blood cells. You have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies, okay, shown here, and um, you are termed universal donor, but the only blood type you can receive is another type O individual. Okay, So that's the story on type O blood. Okay, let's look at a type A individual. Type A blood contains the A antigen on the red blood cells. They will have antibodies against type B antigen which means that a type A individual can receive blood either from a type O individual or another type A individual. 
They have anti-B antibody in their plasma. They have A antigen on their red blood cells. And um, they can receive blood from either A or O individuals. Okay. Now, in a, in a type B individual, what we have is the red blood cell B antigen on the surface of the red blood cells. We have the anti-A antibody in the plasma. Okay, and as a result, we can only receive blood from either a type B individual or a type O individual. If we received blood from an A individual or an AB individual, what would happen? These anti-A antibodies would react with the incoming blood, and they would agglutinate it, and you could kill the patient. Okay? Now, an AB individual is, in a sense, the luckiest individual of all, because... An AB individual has both the A and B antigens on their red blood cells. And as a result, they do not have antibodies against either A or B in their plasma. And as we already stated, there is no antibody against the O antigen. So these individuals can receive blood from any of the other blood types. They can receive A, B, AB, or O. It doesn't make any difference because they have no plasma antibodies against either the A or B antigens. Okay? So they are called universal recipients. And what you can see here is the difference in distribution uh, of these different blood types among the different racial groups here in the United States. And what you'll note is that the um, most frequent blood type uh, among Caucasians and African Americans and Asians and Native Americans is type O. Okay? Uh, second most frequent blood type is type A. Okay? Next most frequent is type B and the least frequent is type AB. Okay? Uh, and, and why is that? Well, honestly, it's luck of the draw. Okay? Um, essentially, the frequency of a gene within a specific population is determined either by uh, natural selection or by random chance. And in the case of the ABO blood groups, we're not talking about any particular antigen that's going to give you a selective advantage over anybody else in terms of your survivability and the, uh, the likelihood that you're going to live long enough to reproduce. So what we're looking at here with the U.S. population is something that would, we could kind of call founder effect, more or less. It's just, it just so happens that the majority of people on this continent happen to have the O allele, the O version of the gene, as opposed to either the A or the B version of the gene in their DNA. And as a result now, uh, this is the most prevalent blood group. Okay? Now, there's another set of antigens that we need to talk about, and these are the RH blood groups. There are 52 named RH agglutinogens, known as RH factors. C, D, and E are the most common. Of those three, D is the most common. RH positive indicates the presence of the D antigen. Okay, so somebody who has the D antigen is RH positive. This is 85% of Americans. Anti-RH antibodies are not spontaneously formed in individuals who are RH minus. Okay? So those individuals lack the D antigen on their red blood cells. Anti-RH antibodies form if RH negative individuals receive RH positive blood or an RH negative mom carries an RH positive fetus at the point of childbirth. So you have to be exposed to the Rh antigen if you're Rh negative in order to begin to generate antibodies against this antigen. Now, this has a consequence, okay? A second exposure to the Rh positive antigen in an Rh negative individual will result in a transfusion reaction, a negative reaction. And so where this comes into play is in mismatched transfusions, or in the scenario in which an RH negative mother has an RH positive child. Okay, so let's talk about the transfusion scenario first. 
let's say that we have an RH negative individual. Let's just for fun say that this individual is O negative. Okay? And then one day, this O negative individual needs some blood. Needs a transfusion. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and let's say this individual <coughs> goes to the local hospital and they get a transfusion, but they happen to get a transfusion of O positive blood. All right. Well, that transfusion will work, okay? In this case, the negative and the positive indicate the presence or the absence of the RH antigen. So an O negative individual lacks the D antigen, while uh, an O positive individual is going to have the D antigen, okay? This is one of the things that confuses people when we're talking about the RH blood groups and the ABO groups, generally when you have your blood typed, they check for both of those different groups. Now, the gene that codes for the D antigen is different from the gene that codes for the A, the B, or the O antigens. They're on, in different locations in the DNA, and they don't have anything to do with each other. Okay? They're, they're just different sets of glycoproteins. So in an individual... Um, who is O negative, what we mean is that individual does not have the A or the B antigen. They have only the antigen that's coded by the gene little i. Okay. And that individual also does not have the D antigen. Instead, they have a gene indicated as little d. Okay. In fact, they have two copies of little i and little d. Okay. Okay, so the D's are referring to this part, okay, and the ABO system is referring to this part, okay. Now, an O positive individual is going to have a genotype of little i, little i, okay, and they're going to have at least one copy of the capital D gene. Okay, so big D, and then in all likelihood, uh, the other allele is little d, but what we'll do is we'll just put a line here and we'll put question mark because it's hard to know what the identity of the other gene is unless we have some information from their children. Okay, so remember that now, guys, that the ABO reference is just referring now to the A, the B, or the O antigen whereas the plus or the minus is referring to the RH group. Two separate genes, two separate pieces of information. Okay? Now, let's say this O negative individual needs a transfusion and he gets some O positive blood. Well, this is going to result now in an exposure of the RH antigen inside this individual. Exposed. Okay. So what's going to happen next? That individual is going to start to make anti-D antibodies. And it'll take a while for those antibody titers to ramp up. So this individual may go their whole life without any problem until, let's say, they went back to the hospital and they needed another unit of blood and they got another O positive transfusion. Now at that point what would happen is that that individual would have a negative reaction that would agglutinate this second transfusion and the result would be massive blockage of capillaries and perhaps the death of that individual. Okay, So it's the second transfusion where we have a problem. Now, a slightly different condition exists in 
Rh negative mothers who are carrying Rh positive children. This is called a hemolytic disease of the newborn, also known as erythroblastosis fetalis. So two different names for the same disease. It occurs only in Rh negative mothers that carry an Rh positive fetus. The Rh negative mom is exposed to the Rh positive blood of the fetus during the delivery of the first baby. This baby will be healthy and suffer no ill effects. However, at the point of birth, the mother's blood and the baby's blood will mix once the placenta has lost its connection with the uterus and that fetal blood now is mixed with the mother's blood. And what happens as a result in the second pregnancy is that the mom's antibodies, which she has produced as a result of that exposure, will cross the placenta and destroy the red blood cells of the Rh positive baby. Now the reason that this happens is because it's a, it's a quirk of biology that the anti-Rh antibody happens to be very small. Okay, In fact, small enough to cross the placenta and cause this kind of problem. Most other antibodies are too large to cross the placenta and attack the baby's tissues. Thank goodness, because you have to remember that every child is going to be genetically different from its mother. And if we had this problem as a result of um, incompatibility of the antigens, what would happen now is that these antibodies could cross any time they want and destroy the alien tissue, all right, the developing fetus. But that doesn't happen, and it's in part due to this size restriction. So the anti-RH antibody is little, okay? It has the ability to cross that placenta and destroy the red blood cells of the RH positive baby. The baby is treated with pre-birth transfusions and exchange transfusions after birth in an attempt to save it. But these days what we have now is a compound called Rogam, which is basically a chemical that can disguise the RH antigen. And as a result, a mother who could potentially have an Rh positive child, if she's administered Rogam before, during, and after the pregnancy, we are basically hiding the Rh antigen from her immune system, and as a result, she will never generate the Rh antibody, and as a result, it will not cross the placenta and destroy the baby's red blood cells and potentially kill the child. Before this Rogam came about, what you used to have to do is go down to the courthouse and have a blood test. And essentially, if there was an RH incompatibility between the husband and the wife, where the man was RH positive and the woman was RH negative, you had three choices. You could get married and not have children. You could get married and adopt. Or you could not get married, because you ran probably a 50% or better chance of that second pregnancy failing due to hemolytic disease of the newborn. But with the advent of Rogam, the need for the blood test was obviated. Okay, So now uh, anybody can marry anybody else uh, regardless of uh, divergent blood types. That's no longer going to result now in a potentially disastrous pregnancy. Okay, transfusion reactions occur if mismatched blood is infused um, into a recipient. The donor cells are attacked by the recipient's plasma agglutinins, the antibodies that are waiting in the plasma for that alien blood. They agglutinate and clog small vessels. This causes the rupture and release of hemoglobin into, into the blood, which results in diminished oxygen carrying capacity, diminished blood flow into the blocked vessels, hemoglobin in the tubules of the kidneys, which results in renal failure. Symptoms include fever, chills, low blood pressure, rapid heartbeat, nausea, and vomiting. The treatment is to prevent the kidney damage using fluids and diuretics to wash out the hemoglobin in an attempt to save the individual's life. A type O individual is termed universal donor because they have neither the A or B antigen on the surface of their erythrocytes. A type AB individual is termed universal recipient because they do not have either the anti-A or anti-B antibodies in their plasma.
other agglutinogens can cause transfusion reactions. Autologous transfusion are where the patient predonates. Essentially what you're doing is you're giving your own blood in an attempt now to give it back to yourself in the event that you need it. Okay, So you can go to a blood donation facility and donate your own blood and basically earmark it for your own use. Uh, not a bad idea, actually. Blood typing is generally done um, prior to a transfusion. It's done by mixing red blood cells with antibodies against its agglutinogens, and this causes clumping of the red blood cells if there is a positive reaction. It's done for both the ABO and RH factors. Cross-matching is where we mix the recipient serum with the donor red blood cells prior to transfusion, and we mix the recipient's red blood cells with the donor serum. And what you're seeing here now is what happens when we have a positive or negative reaction. Okay, So here we have a type AB individual. Okay, Their blood has been sampled. It's been mixed in this particular well with anti-A antibody, and look what happened. It agglutinated. Okay, that's what those little coffee ground looking specks are in the slide. It also agglutinated in the presence of anti-B antibody. And why is that? Because an AB individual has both the A and B antigen on their erythrocytes, and as a result, both antibodies will react. A type A individual is going to agglutinate with the anti-A antibody, but not with the anti-B antibody. See, there's no reaction here. A type B individual will not react with the anti-A antibody and react with the anti-B antibody. Why is that? They have the B antigen, and as a result of exposure to the B antibody in this test, they will form now an agglutinated reaction. A type O individual does not have the A or B antigen, and as a result, will not react, will not agglutinate in either of these two tests. Okay, So remember, the way these tests are done is that we take a blood sample and then we put a little bit of the blood in two different wells, Okay, and then we add two different reagents, one to each well. Okay, In this well, we use the anti-A antibody. In this well, we use the anti-B antibody. But the blood is from the same individual in both wells. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense to you. All right. If we lose too much blood, we can die. Death from shock can result from low blood volume, and it must be replaced immediately with either normal saline or multiple electrolyte solution, known as Ringer solution, that mimics the osmotic concentration of plasma as well as its electrolyte composition. Plasma expanders, such as purified human serum albumin, HETA starch, and dextran can also be used. These mimic the osmotic properties of blood serum albumin, which is a major product of the liver. This is what gives blood a lot of its water-holding properties. More expensive, uh, this is more expensive and can cause significant complications, however. Other diagnostic tests that we can use uh, to basically check whether or not your blood is of the proper composition include the hematocrit, which basically is a test for the number of red blood cells per volume of blood. So this tests the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. Blood glucose tests, which check for the sugar content of your blood. So this is used as a diagnostic for diabetes. And also microscopic examination for variations in the size and shape of red blood cells, which could be indications of anemias. They could be indications of osmotic reactions. They could be indications of certain types of bacterial or viral infections. This is what we call looking at the morphology of the cell, its shape under the microscope. Differential white count is used as a diagnostic test to check for the nature of a particular infection. Remember we talked about the granulocytes and the agranulocytes, which are components of the leukocyte population. And they each have slightly different jobs. Remember, for instance, that the eosinophils are primarily involved in allergic reactions and antiparasitic processes, while the basophils 
primarily respond to bacterial infection and the lymphocytes respond to bacterial viral infections as well as parasitic infections. So if we do a white count and we check what percentages of each of the different types of agranulocytes and granulocytes are present in the plasma, we can figure out in many cases what the nature of your infection might be. Prothrombin time and platelet counts check for hemostasis. Basically what we're asking here is what is your blood's ability to clot? Is it inhibited or is it enhanced or is it normal? SMAC is a blood chemistry profile and it can check for liver and kidney disorders. Basically the liver and the kidney produce a lot of plasma proteins that are vital to the normal function of blood and if we're lacking any of these components it could indicate a malfunction in either the liver or the kidney. A CBC checks for the formed elements. Uh, it essentially is a companion to the hematocrit and to the hemoglobin test and this is a way for us to figure out um, again the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. Okay now let's ask uh, the last question which is where does blood come from? Okay. Fetal blood cells form in the fetal yolk sac. The yolk sac is essentially your sac lunch, that you, that your very first sac lunch in fact that you ever packed and you carried it on your journey down the oviduct to the uterus and it was essentially filled with a, a, a protein and a glycogen rich uh, nutrient gel that fueled your early development. But there's a sac that surrounds it called the yolk sac uh, that contains the what we call the hematopoietic stem cells. So these form in the fetal yolk sac, the liver, and the spleen as well. The red bone marrow is the primary hematopoietic area by the seventh month. Okay, so we change the site of production of blood during fetal development. Blood cells develop from mesenchymal cells called blood islands. The fetus forms hemoglobin F, which is fetal hemoglobin that has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin A, which is formed after birth. The point of hemoglobin F, as we discussed in lecture last Saturday, is that it has a greater ability to scavenge oxygen from the mother's blood than adult hemoglobin. And this, in combination with the normal concentration gradient of oxygen where the placenta interfaces with the maternal blood supply promotes the pickup of oxygen from the maternal blood and eventually its journey back to the fetus. Blood diseases of aging include chronic leukemias, anemias, and clotting disorders. What are leukemias? Leukemias is white blood cell cancer. Okay? Basically what happens is that one or multiple hematopoietic stem cells, those that are primarily tasked with generating the leukocytes, uh, lose their cell controls and they begin to divide in an uncontrolled fashion and they produce white cells that aren't capable of fighting disease. Okay? There are several different types of leukemias. Anemias are basically a lack of red blood cells and these, this can occur for many different reasons. Um, we can have a problem with either red blood cell production or red blood cell destruction. Um, it, in terms of red blood cell production, we might lack iron, for instance, or we might lack B12, which are important components of the heme part of hemoglobin. Um, we might have enhanced red blood cell destruction over production, which would result in a decrease in the hematocrit and a loss of the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. There's also clotting disorders that can occur as we age. We can either have enhanced or decreased tendency to clot. Uh, one of the things that occurs as we age, remember, is that our heart begins to weaken and our activity level begins to drop, and so the rate of blood flow through our blood vessels begins to slow. And the risk there, of course, is the potential now for spontaneous clots, for emboli to form, and this can result eventually uh, perhaps in the blocking of capillary beds, Remember, if this happens in the heart, it can cause a heart attack. If it happens in the brain, it could cause a stroke. Uh, these are usually precipitated by disorders of the heart, the blood vessels, or the immune system. 
Remember, all the body systems work together. They all depend on each other to maintain normal homeostasis. And if one system breaks down, it doesn't break down in a vacuum. It's going to have an impact on all the other body systems. And so you have to think in terms of if something stops functioning, what are going to be the likely outcomes for the other body systems? What else could go wrong? And um, as we study the different body systems this term, we'll sort of touch on that when we look at um, different diseases that affect um, the circulatory system, the reproductive system, the urinary and digestive system, just to name a few. And we'll note what the impact is on the rest of the body. Okay, that brings us to an end here. Um, make sure and watch this uh, lecture. Uh, material from it will be tested on uh, the exams, on the midterms, on the final, and so forth. Um, and I will see everybody on Saturday.